well good morning and welcome again to our nine o'clock service today. Uh, how are you all coping I wonder with the 1.5 meter social distancing? It's not easy is it? You know I must confess that Flo and I are having a bit of trouble because you see our bed is 1.6 meters wide and ugh, means that I keep falling out of bed every night but it is going to get better when we're able to upgrade to a king size bed that'll make it a lot better. Actually, before you think I'm going completely mad, I am only joking, but we all need a few jokes at this uh, time of lockdown, don't we? Now, our Bible reading today is found in Ezra chapter 4, so if you have your Bibles ready, we'll be reading uh, some verses in Ezra chapter 4, and the worship focus topic is entitled Accusations, Dilemmas and Stop Work Meetings, and we'll see why uh, as uh, we proceed. Today, uh, or last week I should say, uh, an altar had been, chapter 3 of Ezra, an altar had been built to the Lord in Jerusalem and sacrifices had recommenced. And after this work began on the new temple, it was all very exciting and when the foundations were laid there was great rejoicing, particularly by the young, yet there were some older priests and Levites who were lamenting because they had remembered Solomon's grander temple which had been destroyed 50 years earlier by the Babylonians and the shouts of joy and the sounds of weeping could not be distinguished and yet they were so loud they could be heard from some distance away well that, that, that's how chapter 3 ends now let's read the first three verses of Ezra chapter 4 and they say this when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Oh, let us help you build, because like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Ezra Hardin, the king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, You have no part with us in building the temple to our God. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as the king of Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Well, firstly, notice there in verse 1 that the small tribe of Benjamin is included with Judah. Benjamin was the only other tribe to remain loyal to King Rehoboam after the United Kingdom of Israel divided way back in 930 BC. And Saul, who was Israel's first king of the United Kingdom, was uh, from the tribe of Benjamin, as was another Saul, Saul of Tarsus, who, as we know, became the Apostle Paul many centuries later. The enemies of Israel to the north in the Persian province known as the Trans-Euphrates were worried. They knew that if the exiles succeeded in building their temple, it would unite them and would make them a potent force to be reckoned with. And so what did they do? Well, here in verse 2, rather cynically, we read that they offered to help. Hmm. Have you ever heard of the saying, beware of Greeks bearing gifts? Well, it was first used by Virgil in about 29 BC in reference to the Trojan horse uh, of uh, the Homer's epic tale, Odyssey. And it, it means, do not trust enemies who bring you presents. Or in this case, do not trust enemies who offer you help, when their real intention, of course, is sabotage. Now, the exiles were very wise to reject this offer for two reasons. Firstly, it was insincere. But in addition, these enemies of Israel worshipped more than one God, not just the God of Israel. So religious purity was at stake here and the returned exiles didn't want to risk revisiting their idolatrous past that had caused so much trouble before the exile in the first place. But their decision to reject the offer made their enemies even more determined. Look at verse 4. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. To discourage means to weaken the hands. To make them afraid literally means to terrify them, such as fear that you'd experience in a war, in a battle. 
Now this very direct tactic of bullying and, and frightening the workers was partially effective but not totally. So in verse 5 the enemies of Israel went even further. We read they bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of Cyrus king of Persia down to the reign of Darius king of Persia. You see plans A and B hadn't worked so plan C was now to use bureaucratic red tape like a difficult council holding up a new building development simply because it had the power to do so. And I think any builder would know exactly the level of frustration that Zerubbabel and his co-workers were experiencing. Firstly, smooth talking hadn't worked. And secondly, scaremongering hadn't entirely stopped the project. But bribing corrupt officials now to create delays and cutting off building supplies this seems to have done the trick. Because fast forward now to verse 24 of chapter 4. In the final verse of chapter 4 we read, Thus the work on the house of the Lord in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So for more than 10, possibly up to 15 years, work on the new temple stopped altogether. And the enemies of Israel had temporarily succeeded. But, as we'll see next week in chapters 5 and 6 of Ezra, it would not be for long. Now back into chapter 4, from verses 6 through to 23, we have an insert or a parenthesis where there is a record of a later attempt by the surrounding nations to halt the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the city, and its walls in round about 450 B.C., and on this later occasion, they sent a letter to the Persian king at the time, Artaxerxes. And in the letter, they described Jerusalem in verse 12 of chapter 4 as a rebellious and wicked city. And in verse 15, a place with a long history of sedition. And they claimed in verse 13 of chapter 4 that if the city was rebuilt with strong walls, its citizens would, would stop paying tax and paid tributes and duties and so forth to the Persian king and thus cause the royal revenues to suffer. Well, this uh, was very uh, significant and for a while their defamatory letter seemed to have worked because in verse 23 of chapter 4, the builders, you see, were compelled by force to stop work until, until a few years later, Nehemiah, the cupbearer of the same Persian king Artaxerxes was able to reverse the royal edict in about the year 445 BC. But that is another story you can read about in the book of Nehemiah. Now what are the lessons we can learn from all this? Well the first lesson is that Satan the deceiver will always oppose the work of God and the people of God. He tempts the hearts of men and women in subtle ways, ways that lead to destruction. So what should we do? Well, in James chapter 4 and verse 7, we're told to submit yourselves then to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, God wants us to be bold and yet cautious. As Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, we are to be as shrewd as snakes and yet as innocent as as doves. Now the second lesson is despite opposition, and there's always plenty of that, we must persevere and keep working for God as long as we are able. We are to be his witnesses, we are to be his ambassadors, and we are to be his light in a very dark world. And if we're opposed, we must simply not just lay down our tools and remain idle. The third and most important lesson of all is for us to understand that even though we may at times stop working for God, He never stops working on our behalf. In John chapter 5 verse 17, replying to the Jewish leaders who questioned the right of Jesus to heal a cripple on the Sabbath, Jesus said, My Father is always at His work to this very day, and I too am working. Now, how reassuring. Both God the Father and God the Son are constantly working for our benefit. They never stop. 
Now, a few weeks ago, I referred to Psalm 121 about the Lord being the maker of heaven and earth and being our helper and that he never slumbers or sleeps. Well, today I'd like to conclude by highlighting the final two verses of this wonderful psalm. And they say this, The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. Yes, indeed. With the triune God, there are no stop work meetings. There's no time off. And protests by those who don't believe in God will never alter his plans. As it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Our God never slumbers or sleeps. He never ceases watching over us and working for our good. And for that, we should always be grateful. So keep these things in mind during these very worrying days that we're now facing. And until next week, please stay healthy and stay strong. And goodbye. It is a big challenge for the Christian believers to decline offers or associate with non-believers 
some time Esra chapter 4 we see the offer made by the people of Samaria Judah and Benjamin appears to be very genuine they only wanted to help the rebuilding of the temple then what is the problem however these people served their own gods but also took up the worship of the lord of israel as the god of the land it is a spiritual battle but verse 3 we can see that the leaders of israel at that time were godly people namely serubabel joshua and other head of families they have refused to accept the offer as they did not want to compromise their faith with non believers this is the important lesson for us to learn from chapter 4 from chapter 1 to 3 we have already seen the love and faithfulness of god towards his people jeremiah chapter 31 verse 3 the lord appeared to us in the past saying i have loved you with an everlasting love i have drawn you with the love loving kindness but the people of israel have trusted their lord their enemies only victory was to delay the work of rebuilding the temple of temple for 15 years and not to defeat it the question for us do we trust completely our lord do we compromise our faith with non believers Isaiah chapter 26 verse 4 Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord the Lord is the rock eternal Psalms chapter 62 verse 6 He alone is my rock and my salvation He is my fortress I will not be shaken we need to trust the lord in all circumstances second timothy chapter 1 verse 12 apostle paul wants to encourage timothy yet i am not ashamed because i know whom i have believed and i am convinced that he is able to guard what i have entrusted to him for that day dear friends john chapter 3 verse 16 very well known verse for god so loved the world that we he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life first john chapter 3 verse 1 how great is the love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of god and that is what we are may the lord bless these words to trust him more from the bottom of our hearts because he is good and his love to us endures forever he is good and his love to us enders forever amen
Good morning and welcome to the Communion Focus once again this week. Let me just read two verses. Um, one of them is from Ezra chapter 4 and verse 24. It says, Thus the work of the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of King Darius. 
of Persia. So I've straight away gone straight to the positive part of, of Ezra chapter 4 because right through the chapter 4 we read of the interference that um, we see in the stopping of the uh, re rebuilding of the Temple of Jerusalem. And that is completely caused by uh, Satan using those the, the people in the area, the councillors, to bring the the whole building to a, a complete stop. But what I want to focus on is not only the fact that in verse 24 we see that, that there's a glimmer of hope, but also in verse 5 of chapter 5, I just want to look behind the curtain just for a second and read out verse 5, which relates to the following week. But it says, verse 5 of chapter 5, But the eye of their God was watching over the elders of the Jews, and they were not stopped until the report could go to Darius and his written reply be received. So there's some positive outcome there, in the sense of we, we don't leave chapter 4 as in, in a case where, where it's all doom and gloom and, and Satan has complete control. But no, it was only a, a period of some 15 odd years where, where everything just came to a stop. But the Lord had his eye and had complete control over all things. And as it is with, with when we come to the Lord's table this morning, we, we know that the Lord, when Jesus hung on the cross and died on the cross for us, Satan also, in essence, tried to interfere with the death of the Lord by using those around and called out to Jesus and said, if you're the son of God, come down from the cross. You don't need to die on the cross. You don't need to die for the world's sins. You've done all you need to do. You're hanging on the cross. Come down now. Not so. Let me just read out to you some words that, are, that I, I remember from one of my hymns that quite often I used to sing in my younger years. And it goes like this, and this is, relates to the chorus. It goes like this. All the way to Calvary he went for me. He went for me. He went for me. All the way to Calvary he went for me. For what reason? He died to set me free. So there, there we go. The Lord Jesus went all the way. Not just half. He gave his life for us at the cross of Calvary. He allowed his body to hang on the cross. He allowed his body to be broken for us. He also allowed his blood to be poured out for us. This morning, as we partake of the emblems, let's remember the fact that the Lord, our Saviour and our Father is in complete control of all things. So let's give thanks this morning for the bread, for the body that was broken for us at Calvary. Let's give thanks now. Heavenly Father, we come again this morning in remembrance of you as we come around the table in our homes as we break bread. Let's remember the fact that uh, you went all the way to Calvary for us. Your body broken for us and you hung on the cross and you died there for us. Lord, may we just remember the sacrifice, the love that you had for each one of us and that you broke, allowed your body to be broken for each one of us. Lord, again this morning we thank you for these things, Lord Jesus. Amen.
and let's give thanks now for the cup, the cup which does represent the blood that was poured out at Calvary for us. Let's give thanks for the cup. Heavenly Father, too, this morning, not only your body broken for us, but your blood poured out for us. It was made complete at Calvary by your blood pour, being poured out for us. The temple, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom that we could boldly come into the presence of our Creator through the precious blood of you, Lord Jesus. Lord, again this morning we give thanks for that blood that was poured out as we take this cup this morning. May we remember the sacrifice at Calvary that you made for each and every one of us. Amen. Morning. In Ezra 4, we read about the enemies around set out to discourage the Jews, to frighten them with threats of warfare, and to bribe counsellors to work against them. It was so difficult that the work to rebuild the house of God was stopped till the second year of Darius. In the book of Haggai, we discover another reason why the work was stopped. The Jews were distracted. They visited themselves with their own house. There was drought and the harvest was bad, and there was inflation and life was in, indeed difficult. These two factors, the opposition and the distraction, led them to conclude that the time 
had not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Perhaps they were thinking, we would do it when the situation was better. In Haggai chapter 1 verse 1, it says that the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Jeroboam and Joshua. It came in the form of a reminder, of a rebuke, and a promise and an encouragement. The reminder is that their Lord is the Lord Almighty or the Lord of hosts in some translations. This special name of God is used many times in the book of Haggai and Zechariah. And uh, in fact, if you add in Malachi, it was used more than 90 times. This is to remind the Jews that their God is the Almighty One and they need not fear their enemies. It is also a reminder for them that they owe Him allegiance. The rebuke is this. Is it time for you to dwell in your panic houses while this house is in ruins? Do you keep feathering your nest and neglect the house of God? Drought and inflation was God's rebuke to them. That's what Haggai says. And the circumstances have not changed, but they obeyed the word of the Lord that came through Haggai. And they returned to build the house of the Lord. And then come the, the promise and the encouragement. They were told to be strong because the Lord is with them. They were told not to fear. They were told that God will shake the heavens and the earth and the nations and bring the treasures in. They were told that they were part of a greater plan, that this house will have even greater glory than the former house. The first temple saw the Shekinah glory of God descending upon it. The second temple saw the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. God came and God the Son and came into his temple. And instead of drought, the harvest become plentiful. And you read in chapter 6 of Esther that when the enemies saw that the Jews were rebuilding the house again, house of the Lord again, they reported them to King Darius. But this time, they were ordered not to interfere with the work, with the threat of severe punishment if they do so. But instead, they had to pay for all their, ex all their expenses without fail. In times of opposition and distraction, we need to hear the word of the Lord again. We need people to speak to us clearly of our times, of our state, and what God wants. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. What is the word of the Lord saying to us at this time?
Good morning again and welcome again. Well, after our focus last week, where we saw the people of Israel jubilant at laying the foundation stone, we have gone rapidly into the real world where they strike opposition. People around them are discouraging, making them doubt their purpose, whilst others are deliberately taking steps to prevent them from rebuilding the temple, until finally the order comes from King Darius of Persia to stop work. It must have been a huge disappointment to them. Often things don't go the way we had expected them to, and that's why we pray continually for God's guidance, providence and intervention, acknowledging that we always want to be within the will of God. As we read in Matthew 6 in the Lord's Prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you need help or prayer at this time, the office at Canterbury Gardens Community Church is still open with pastors working remotely. You can find all those details online at our website cgcc.org.au. Stay safe and may God bless you. Flo is going to lead us now in our pastoral prayer. Thanks, Flo. Thanks, Colin. It is Thursday morning as I prepare this prayer. This afternoon I'm having the first of the laser surgeries on my left eye to try and help with the glaucoma. Hopefully the right eye will be done next Friday. I want to thank all those who've been praying for me. I'm very grateful for your love and support as the thought of having holes drilled in my eyes is not very exciting, but I do need some relief. God has given me a real sense of peace and I trust that he will be with me through this as he has promised. This morning I'm going to have another little quote from Amy Carmichael. She was a lady who suffered much physical pain over many years. And we know that in our church family there's lots of folk who are dealing with difficult issues, some physical, mental, spiritual, emotional. This is a poem which I will use as part of our prayer today. She says, Dear Lord, for all in pain, we pray to thee. O come and smite again thine enemy. Give to thy servants skill to soothe and bless, and to the tired and ill give quietness. <clears throat> and Lord, to those who know pain may not cease, come near that even so they may have peace. Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for all those men and women through the ages who have shared with us their trust, their insights in all that you have taught them in the circumstances of their lives so that we may be encouraged and strengthened in our own walk with you. Dear Lord, we see the same trust in Sue Graham as she continues to encourage others even though her own health is very precarious now. Father, it's hard to do, but Sue has asked that we pray that this last difficult stage of her earthly journey will be short, as she sees how hard it is for Lloyd and Christopher. God of mercy, be merciful to dear Sue. Grant her the desire of her heart as heaven is calling. Keep us always dependent on you, Lord. Loving Lord Jesus, we pray for Emmanuel as he's finding the treatment very difficult. Father, help Sue as she cares for him and for his next oncology appointment when they will have a better idea of whether the treatment's working and can be continued. Father God, we continue to pray for Pete that he will have stability in his emotions as he continues to improve. Bless Bronnie as she constantly seeks to encourage and help him, along with Bill and Fran. Lord Jesus, bless James too, as every day he trusts you with his ongoing illness. And Father, we know there are many others who are struggling, some with stresses of illness or grief, some with relationship pressures, family pressures, financial job and business challenges 
for many it is such a challenge to be even able to pay their mortgage or their rent and we know this puts extra pressure on their families. Dear Lord Jesus, be very near to all who are struggling. We know, Lord, there's an increasing number of people who are feeling desperate with the current lockdown in our state of Victoria. And we would ask for wisdom for our governments and health leaders in whatever decisions they make in the future. Holy Spirit, we would pray again for our older folk as we know how vulnerable they are at this time, but not just from illness, from loneliness too. Help us to be aware of and sensitive to their needs and where possible to be an encouragement by phone calls, sending notes or cards that we can reassure them they are not forgotten but are dearly loved. Help us to consider our neighbours too, Lord Jesus, many of whom do not know you as Saviour and Lord. And as we pray for them, we pray for our own families and friends who also do not know the joy of the peace that comes with you, knowing their sins are forgiven, to be remembered no more forever. Father God, let us be like Epaphras, who Paul, when writing to the Colossians, said, he was always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Father, for all those people and issues for which we have prayed, may your will be done. Amen.